All right, looks like we're at the top of the hour for 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time, <laughs> 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Um, and today we are going to go ahead and kick off the second webinar hosted by Flower Hill Institute. Uh, yat eh, everyone. My name is Shandeen Jones. I am the communications manager for Flower Hill Institute, and today I'll be the moderator for today's presentation. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today uh, to listen out and to watch um, the Indigenous Animals Harvesting and Meat Processing Grant IEG program webinar. Uh, today we'll go over some general overview about the IEG program, as well as some in in eligibility, as well as ineligibility and scoring criteria, and some additional tips and resources available to all USDA grant applicants, including the USDA Meat and Poultry Processing Capacity Technical Assistance Program. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and posted on the Flower Hill Institute YouTube channel, as well as the Flower Hill Institute MPPTA webinars page. And at the end of today's presentation, we'll be conducting a Q&A session. So please hold all questions until the end of today's IEG segment or post them in the chat below in the Q&A um, chat feature to ensure that your questions are included at the, at the end of today's presentation. Uh, without further ado, joining us here today, we have Mr. Dave Carter, the Technical Assistance Provider Director for Flower Hill Institute, as well as presented uh, co-presenting with Dr. Ro Robert Maddock, the MPBTA Technical Assistance Officer for American Meat Science Association. Um, without further ado, Dave. Uh, sorry, your um, your microphone's on mute. There we go. All right. Thank you, Shandine. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, this is the second webinar we've done this week. We did one on um, earlier this week on the MCAP grant. And today we're going to focus on the uh, Indigenous Animal Harvesting Grant, which is really a unique program that USDA has, has just issued. And I'm really pleased um, also providing some backup here when we get into some of the question and answers. My fellow uh, regional director, Chris Roper, who has done a lot of work in Indian country over the last 16 years. And also Catherine Minthorn is on from the Intertribal Agricultural Council. And of course, IEC is one of our technical service uh, providers. So with that, I am going to see if I can get my screen up here. And I'm hoping that you can see it, Chandine. You're good, Dave. We can see it. Good. Okay. So now let's. So, as we said, uh, this is on the Indigenous Animal Harvesting and Meat Processing Grant. And by the way, Chandine, I love that photo that you picked out for that. Uh, that's a beautiful photo. So, this grant is really part of a broad initiative that USDA uh, in the Biden-Harris administration has made over the past year and a half to create a more resilient, diverse, and equitable meat and poultry processing system. And to that end, they have dedicated a billion dollars for a variety of, of programs. And What's important is they recognize right from the get-go that this is not just about building meat processing plants or poultry processing plants. It's really about building successful businesses and helping to strengthen the food security and sovereignty of a lot of underserved producers, including tribal nations. And so as a part of that, they pulled together a really diverse and qualified group of, of technical service providers to work with folks all the way from locating the, the grants and finding out whether they're qualified to going through that process. And then even after the award, standing up their business, developing their facilities and, and their plans. This is a long-term commitment that USDA has made. And the Flower Hill Institute was brought on to play the coordination role. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Flower Hill Institute, it's an indigenous led nonprofit based on the Jemez Pueblo in New Mexico. And they really have four pillars. There's food and agriculture, climate resiliency, cultural preservation, and youth and education. And so this coordination role for this project really fits within their food and agriculture pillar. So the, the playing field that we have for these grants, I think I missed a slide there. Yeah, but let me just say the other groups that are part of this network 
include then, as I said before, the Intertribal Agriculture Council. It includes the Niche Meat Processing Assistance Network, which is a um, extension-based program out of Oregon State University. It includes the American Association of Meat Processors, which as they describe themselves is the largest organization of meat processors, but they don't represent the largest meat processors. They represent essentially everybody but the, the big four. It includes the American Meat Science Association uh, where Rob Maddock hangs his hat and the Agricultural Utilization Research uh, Institute. And then above and beyond that, we have developed uh, memorandums of understanding partnerships with more than a dozen organizations, including the Intertribal Buffalo Council and the uh, North American Native American Development Corporation, along with others. So it's really a, a dynamic program. And it's needed because of the suite of grants that USDA has issued. And just to take a look at what has been issued and, and what's on the, the table right now, there have been two rounds of what they call the EMPER grant. That's the Meat and Poultry Inspection Readiness Grant, which has been out there to help facilities make the improvements and get ready to go under USDA inspection. There was the first round of the Meat and Poultry uh, Processing Expansion Program grant that was issued, that came out of last April. They really started awarding those in November and December. There was the Meat and Poultry Intermediary Lending Program, uh, which provided up to $15 million to nonprofit lenders, community development corporations, and others um, to provide a revolving fund of loan funds that could go out for projects. The, the uh, National Institute for Food and Agriculture, which is a part of USDA, put out resources for workforce training at technical schools and community colleges, including some of the 1994 tribal colleges. There have been then a suite of programs, the Value Added Grant Program, the Farmers Market Promotion Growth Program, and the others. Those are all closed right now. Technically, Value Added Grant Program is still open, but if you're going to mail it in, you got about three days to, to get that done. There's the Rural Energy for America Program Grant, which is a revolving it's an ongoing grant that will help folks develop uh, projects, solar energy, energy reduction, climate smart projects. And that is ongoing through the end of uh, 2024 20, on a quarterly basis. And so that's a, a really good program. And then there's the supply chain loan guarantee program. Those two grants continue to be open. Earlier this week, we talked about the local uh, meat capacity grant or MCAP, but today we're really gonna focus on the indigenous animal harvesting grant. So first of all, the authority of this, this was really funded through the American Rescue Plan that was passed last year. And it's a cooperative or a collaborative approach between USDA rural development specifically the Rural Business Cooperative Service within rural development and the Agricultural Marketing Service in consultation with the Office of Tribal Relations. And Office of Tribal Relations has gone out and done a series of listening sessions and, and sought input from tribal nations over the last couple of years. And they took that input and worked with rural development and AMS to put together this program, which as I said, is I think one of the most innovative that USDA has done. So what we've got is they've allocated up to $50 million in funding. And what it's being used for is traditional harvesting, sustenance harvesting, with a real focus on indigenous animals and community protein processing operations. All species, including what we call amenable species, are eligible, but indigenous species are given a, a preference. So those non-amenable species like bison, deer, and elk, and others, um, this includes, we'll talk about this, a lot of seafood. So we'll talk about it in just a minute. Commercial viability is not a consideration. You don't have to prove that this is going to be a for-profit operation, but let me just stress, in the grant, you do have to stress that you have financial viability, that you have the ability to sustain this project after the funding is done, even though that may not be selling products in the, in the marketplace. 
the application eligibility is limited to tribal governments. Um, and those are the ones that are defined in the federally recognized Indian tribe list of 1994. And it includes, you know, wholly owned arms, the, the agriculture department or the Department of Natural Resources within a tribe. They can be that because they're part of that tribal government. And it also includes multi-tribal government entities. So there's an opportunity for collaboration among tribes in this as well. So the goals of this are to support traditional harvesting medicine, indigenous animals and community animal protein processing with a focus to address the needs for local animal protein processing capacity in tribal communities and tribal food supply chains. We all saw what happened during COVID when tribal nations and tribal communities were just devastated by the disruption and in the supply chain. And this is really a step forward to help us make sure that we never have to go through that again. So this is looking to expand or enhance the protein processing in Indian country. And they're looking for diversity within indigenous animals. They're looking for geographic diversity. They're looking for different types of, of models. Catherine and I were just talking before we came on here about some of the processes that her mom and her grandmother used to use that would certainly qualify under this, uh, this grant program. Now, the folks that aren't eligible for this are processing businesses that are owned by non-tribal governmental entities, entities or individual tribal members. So if you have a, a stockman's association within a tribe or you have a nonprofit that's not associated with the government or something like that, they aren't eligible. They need to work with their tribal government. But I want to stress that there's a lot of other funding opportunities out there. I talked about the Rural Energy for America, the Supply Chain uh, Loan Guarantee Program, and certainly the local MCAP, the local meat capacity program that's really focused on equipment and infrastructure development. So those grant opportunities, you can find them at a, at a couple of places. Number one is if you go to usda.gov backslash meet. There's a whole list of open funding opportunities. You can click on that and go to those. And Flower Hill Institute has an online toolkit where we continuously update a summary of the grants and loans that are open and available. So you can get that off of our website. Now, under the IAG, the eligible activities you have and this is really specified. This is a great area to go into the request for um, applications and go through because there's a nice list of the types of things. But this is just some of them that are in there. So demonstrate the ability to improve the harvesting, slaughter, and processing, the capacity, the packaging, and the distribution. So this can include building, expanding, um, upgrading facilities, it can include indigenous harvesting and processing, like I say, fixed, mobile, or even some others. You can purchase facilities and renovate them. You can update outdated facilities. Um, and it includes things for, you know, if you want to develop holding pens and, and handling equipment to, to improve humane slaughter. And then there's a series of secondary activities to update in excuse me, initiate or upgrade waste management and wastewater to purchase or upgrade composting and rendering equipment related to the processing of animal protein, develop packaging and labeling capabilities. And one of the things that, you know, sticks out to me in this grant is when they talk about this, they talk about processing the animal proteins, but they don't specifically talk about processing those proteins just for human consumption. So I believe that this grant has more flexibility for these tribal projects to make better use of the byproducts, to make sure that we're using that whole animal out of respect to that animal. This is an opportunity to get really creative with, with some projects on that. Now, the areas that can be used um, for this is for construction, for renovation, it can be used for project specific staff expenses, and that's important. Those staff expenses have to be related to the project 
that you are seeking the grant for. You can't use the unrelated expenses. The same thing with working capital. It has to be related to that specific project and processing equipment. So the allowable cost is our equipment purchases that support indigenous animals harvest and meat processing, the processing aggregation or storage investments, the value chain and supply chain innovations or upgrades, including um, equipment or technology upgrades to support process adaptations, special use vehicles for distributing the meat or for bringing the animals to harvest, for developing products, packaging, marketing of agricultural products. As I said, commercial viability is not key on this, but I know many tribal nations are developing processing projects that have a commercial aspect, and that's certainly allowable. Now, one of the things that is important to remember too is that this is focuses on um, indigenous species, but if you're going to process what we call the amenable species, you, cattle, hogs, poultry, those type of things, there's a little bit difference in the requirement because those amenable species do require that then you comply with all federal food safety and that you demonstrate that you're moving toward a federal inspection. So there's a little bit of a difference of that. And then finally, any uh, purchases over $5,000 in this grant have to be approved in writing by USDA. Now, there's certain things that aren't allowed. You can't go out and buy or lease land. You can't purchase uh, company cars that aren't related to the, the project. You can't pay for technical assistance. That's why we're here. We're here to provide the technical assistance at no charge to, um, the, to the tribes and businesses that are applying for these grants. You can't use it to cover planning or feasibility studies. You can't use it to pay for a grant writer. You certainly can't use it to duplicate um, any expenses if they're covered by another federal grant or being reimbursed by a third party. Well, that would be considered double dipping. You only get one chance to pay for something. So make sure that in your application, you, you make that very clear that you're keeping it, um, that you're keeping it separate. Now, here's what we talk about is the amenable species. And it's a little bit confusing because catfish, or I can't even pronounce that. So let's just call it catfish. Those are considered an amenable species because they are under federal inspection by USDA. But your non-amenable species, bison, reindeer, game meat, seafood processing, we were just talking, it may include prairie dogs, um, groundhogs, uh, you know, that some uh, traditional cultures have used. But it also includes uh, wild-caught fish and seafood. So again, this is really an innovative approach. And the difference, again, is if you're going to include the amenable species, then you have to comply with the the food safety and demonstrate the intent to go to federal inspection. That's not a requirement for the non-amenable species. And when you think about this, rather than just focusing on one of the indigenous species, they're really looking for tribes to have a variety of, of species that they may be uh, processing under this grant. Now, Another unique aspect of this grant is it does not require any matching of funding. This is fully funded projects with up to 36 months, up to three years to complete after the grant award. The, um, there is no maximum award or minimum award on this. This is really where USDA is saying, bring us the project that you think needs to be funded. And that's what we're gonna look at. And then, there are the numbers that, that you go through when you put together your application, uh, the requirements to have that opportunity number and the assistance listing number. That's a little bit in the weeds. That's all listed in the request for application. Now, when grants come in, I always like to recommend folks that there's three key areas in any grant. First of all, what does it fund and what am I required to, to use as match? We just covered that this funds a whole lot of different processes and opportunities with no matching requirements. Number two, am I eligible? 
This is very clear. It's tribal governments that are the eligible entities. But the third thing is every USDA grant has a scoring criteria. And that is listed, I forget where it starts on, I think page 21 of the, of the RFA. And it's very important to read that because that is then where the reviewers are gonna go through and start rating you or scoring you compared to the other applicants. So this one has 25 points. Literally one fourth of the scoring is on the alignment and intent. This is for indigenous animals. This is for traditional harvesting. This is for indigenous informed uh, processing methods. Second is technical merit. Can it be done? Do they have the capabilities and does it you know, have the, the resources to do that? Third, achievability. Can they achieve this within that third three year period? Do they have the expertise and the management to get it done? And is the fiscal plan and the financial viability there? Once again, this is not market-based, but you have to show that it can be sustained either through a commitment by the tribal government or through some other means after that three-year period. And then finally, the community impact and support. How is this project really going to increase food security and the ability of tribal uh, communities to feed themselves. Then this grant also has, I call it the bonus points. It's a, a, um, a discretionary that can be awarded based upon the diversity of indigenous animals. And that's where I say they aren't looking for just processing bison or deer. They're looking really to have a diversity of animals that, that are going to be looked at. So that is the scoring criteria. And I'm going to turn it over to Rob Maddock because he's been on some of these review panels and could go in and talk about how you start to develop your grant application so that it scores as high as possible. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and let Rob take over. There, thanks, Dave. Uh, so I'm gonna continue with this and we got a nice lead into how those scoring criteria work. And I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit and provide some, hopefully some hints and, and information about what makes your proposal viable and what uh, you know the what grant reviewers are looking for. Uh, so like Dave said, uh, my name is Rob Maddock. I'm with American Meat Science Association. Prior to starting as the technical assistance provider uh, with AMSA, I was a professor at North Dakota and South Dakota State uh, for many years. Um, so you, you know, you, what I'm going to tell you, you've done all the good work, right? You've, you've done, you've got all your paperwork done. You're into grants.gov. Uh, you've written your proposal out, uh, and then what happens to it? How can uh, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about? Uh, let's see. Let's do that. Uh, about how uh, USDA is going to evaluate your proposal. And so you get this, in, uh, initially your proposal goes through again. Uh, I believe everything going through grants.gov on this. And uh, it's going to be reviewed before it goes out for uh, by USDA before they're going to send it back out to the, the panel that's going to review this. Um, and what they're making sure is you you completed it, right? It's not a half filled out forms. The signatures are there. You're actually eligible, which is uh, for this grant uh, is is a big deal because the eligibility is is quite a bit tighter than some other programs. And that it's appropriate, you know, that uh, what you're actually proposing at least fits in the the scope and the aims of the of the project of the the grant itself. Um, if it doesn't, if you don't have it completed. Um, it could be rejected at this point. Uh, there probably is some wiggle room, I think, with this to uh, to make some things right, but it, it can be there. Hopefully you've gone through all and did everything right to this point. It, uh, the USDA personnel do not evaluate or rank your proposal beyond to make sure that it's all there, it's complete and it's appropriate. What happens then is the USDA will hire a panel manager 
uh, with some knowledge about the program, about what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and them, along with the rest of the, the personnel there, are going to recruit panelists with some uh, some knowledge and some expertise. Um, oftentimes, these are university meat scientists. There's business, business and industry experts. I'm assuming for the ind Indigenous uh, Harvest Grant here, there'll be some people with some knowledge of uh, Native Indigenous foods. Um, so it's a nice mixture of people that are going to evaluate your proposals as they come in. Uh, then the way this typically happens, and this is depending on how many proposals have been submitted, uh, each panelist or each reviewer has three grants that they look at. So if, for example, if 100 grants came in, uh, we would need 33 or 34 different panelists to look at these. Um, but uh, each panelist in S3, and there is a primary, secondary, and tertiary, your first, second, and third reviewer. And the first reviewer, goes through and they will completely read your proposal, understand it, uh, know all about it. Uh, they're gonna spend some time there, take some notes, and they're gonna assign scores. And that rubric that uh, Dave already submitted is where they're gonna start. Um, but that first reviewer then is gonna do a real deep dive into, into your proposal. The second reviewer also reads it completely. Um, they need to know what's going on. They're gonna put make notes of strengths and weaknesses, and they're gonna provide uh, scores as well. Uh, that as a second reviewer. And then there's a third person in the review panel that's going to read your proposal. Um, they may not read it quite as deep because they've already got two other proposals that they had to know uh, very well. Uh, so they're going to go through it, understand your objectives. They may add some notes. Uh, they may or might not actually score your, your proposal at this time. But uh, what, what this third uh, reviewer does, too, is they make sure that I think uh, they can say, I think the first two people missed something or I want to point this thing out that I think I saw in this grant. OK, and so the reviewers have your proposals, hopefully for a couple or three weeks before um, they get together to talk about them. Um, but sometimes uh, things get a little compressed, so they can be. Uh, it could be as short as a week uh, to ten days that your reviewers actually have these and have to read all three of these uh, proposals. Okay, then the whole panel comes together. So every reviewer, whether it's ten reviewers or fifty reviewers, and if there gets to be that big, there may be actually uh, panels running concurrently um, at the same time. But uh, the whole panel gets together. So all those grant reviewers, these experts who have read your proposals, come together. We do it online now. Uh, we used to go out to Washington, D.C. to do this, or we could meet in Kansas City. But now it's done online, which really helps because we can get a very diverse population of people looking at these proposals. In the review proposal, then, the grants, each of the proposals is kind of uh, set in a random order. And we know the order before we start. And then, you know, grant number one, the number one or the primary panelist or reviewer presents the proposal to the entire board. Now, again, if there's 20 people on this board, only three people have actually read your proposal, uh, the, for the first, second, and third reviewers. And the first reviewer, the first panelist presents the proposal. And they're going to give a, an overall summary, the strengths, the weaknesses, and the feasibility. Now, because of the number of proposals we typically see, they only have five minutes to do this. Okay. The secondary panelists then fills in. They have three additional minutes. Uh, said, here's in addition to what the primary reviewer said, or panelists, I've got these things to add. Uh, I agree, or maybe they don't necessarily agree with the, the per first panelist. And then there's a little bit of time for that third panelist, if there's any time left over, to fill in the gaps. Say, yep, I kind of agree, or I think there's some other things we need to talk about. Then the entire panel will do some Q&A, They'll discuss the proposal, but remember, the majority of this panel probably hasn't seen your proposal. But in total, this is a typical grant review process, there's only 12 minutes for each proposal. At the end, then, any sort of input is taken from the larger uh, committee, the larger panel, and scores are assigned. During that discussion, that primary panelist who knows your proposal best takes notes of the discussion, and then there's a grant reporting or grant scoring system that's set up with the federal government. And they go in and enter their notes uh, and the scores that were kind of agreed upon by the entire panel. 
And then the second and third panelists can go in and add notes too. This is done sequentially. Um, they can't do it at the same time. The first panelist, when he's in, for example, is, everybody else is locked out. But they get to add their notes, um, but they really don't change the scores at this point. Those scores have been decided by the, the larger panel. After they've been reviewed by the entire panel, then all the proposals have been said. Sometimes this takes two or three days. Uh, there's usually two or three full days of panel reviews that happen. Um, what you get then is the overall the different proposals are ranked and they'll come back and USDA or whoever's managing the panel will, will sit down with the entire panel again uh, with the ranking of the scores, usually highest to lowest ranked, which makes sense. And the entire panel then has a chance to go through and discuss and and confirm the rankings now depending on the proposal the program sometimes the panelists uh provide input of where the the funding cutoff is it's like uh we've got 100 proposals it looks like there's enough funding based on the budgets to fund the top 35 of them uh and sometimes they help draw that line but not always um again there could be that line can move just a little bit uh, but uh, and there could be some adjustments if things look really similar. The, all of that data then is sent back uh, to the USDA personnel. And in this case, it would be uh, uh, Egg Marketing Service, Rural Development, and Office of Tribal Relations, I believe will have a, a role in this. And they're going to make the final funding decisions, but they will not, uh, they're going to change the rank a whole lot. Um, because that's the, the point of the, the review process. So again, the ranking is pretty important here, but USDA is going to make those final funding decisions. Uh, and so they're going to go through, they're going to double check some things as well um, before they make those decisions. What's really important, what I want to drive home on this is you, your proposal is only seen by an entire panel for 12 minutes. Um, so that's obviously not a lot of time. You, you may have dozens or hundreds of hours into writing this that uh, may seem a little, uh, um, frustrating that the entire panel can't spend much time on this, but unless we're going to spend months at a time trying to review proposals, this is uh, kind of the system that has been proven to work pretty well. So what do you got to do? You have to make sure that the primary reviewer, the person who is presenting your grant to the panel, is a champion of your project. You have to sell it to the, and you don't know who this person is, uh, your reviewers, you, they're anonymous to you for the most part. Uh, but you have to sell it. It's got to be a good idea and a good proposal. If the first reviewer, and I've been in several panels, really is like lukewarm or doesn't even like your, your proposal, it's never going to get funded. Not never, but the chances are very low. And so you have to convince the reviewers that you have a good idea and they do accomplish it. And that's what we talked about uh, with that scoring, knowing those scoring uh, uh, rubric is pretty important because uh, the important things you, you have to score high with the number one, your primary reviewer. Um, so in order to accomplish that, there's a couple things that uh, we got to uh, think about. Now, Dave went through these, so I'm not going to rehash this too much, but alignment, intent, technical merit, achievability, all of these things have to be addressed. And when a reviewer is scoring a proposal, they're again, they got this rubric in front of them. They need to be able to find these things. And I'll say that here in a little bit. Um, but make sure you're addressing those things. Okay. Uh, we talked about they got MCAP there. Um, this one's a little bit different, but make sure that your alignment intent, technical merit achievability. Uh, we went through that. Um, do you have the expertise and all of these other things? I think uh, a little bit different, but. Um, some other things, community impact and support, and I didn't, uh, I'm not sure on this one, uh, but knowing that the community is behind the project, super important. Uh, we've always often been asked about uh, how many letters is, is enough, how many is too many. The more community support you can show from very, from different places, people, organizations, the better. Okay. So how are you going to sell this to the reviewer, especially that primary reviewer with the entire panel? Format matters, okay? There are forms that you're going to use that uh, that you download out of the proposal um, that, you, you know, you got to be in the right format um, and alignment, like I said already, okay? But the one of the things I really want to address or really emphasize is make sure that your reviewers can find the information, especially in that scoring rubric, okay? Set it right up top. Use bolds, use underlines, use a lot of white space, okay? 
um, make sure that we can find what we're looking for for all those merit uh, things that get scored on. Put the important things at the top. Say, here is our idea, and here's how we're going to accomplish it. And you can be redundant, right? There's going to be a project summary at the top that's a, a short little thing that says what you're going to do. But say those things over and over again. Here's our idea. Here's why it's important. Here's why it's going to work. Okay. And like I said, bold those things out. Use bullet points. Um, most of the proposals we see, if you dig deep enough, the idea is good, right? We're going to increase our capacity. In this instance, we're in a harvest, you know, we're going to do wild caught or, or, or wild harvest. Um, and uh, one of our IEC people talks about reindeer in Alaska, uh, which would certainly fall into this grant. We're going to use these to feed people. Good idea. Okay. But if I have to hunt for that idea, it's because you've, you've kind of muddled around uh, and you're not selling it right at the top, it's hard to find. And then how are you going to do it? How are you going to accomplish this thing? And is it feasible? Um, so make sure, put those things right out front, bold them, and then be redundant with it as well. Uh, I think you guys probably know all this, um, so I'm not going to spend time on this because I'm guessing cause since we're dealing with tribal organizations, they're probably fairly well uh, uh, versed in getting uh, set up for that. So last couple things I want to say. Uh, when I've been on panels, the panels that get funded and are rated the highest have a plan to succeed, right? They are on top of it. The idea, like everybody has a good idea, almost always. It doesn't get very far with an idea, but having that plan to succeed is what the reviewers really like to see. Okay, so know that RFA, make sure you've gone through it, read it, have it next to you when you're writing your proposals. Okay, um, and remember this, reviewers are human. You need to have your proposal edited. Now, if you're a strong editor or you have other people who are, sloppy format, misspelled words, poor grammar. Um, even if your idea is good, even if your rationale and, and reasoning is sound or excellent, if it's poorly written, uh, the reviewer is not going to score it as high. And again, that's just people being people. Um, so have someone not familiar with the project proofread your proposal. Uh, don't try and do you edit your own work. Um, you should have enough time, enough uh, assistance to have somebody else, maybe not even somebody who knows what's going on with the proposal, read it and provide some inputs. And they're going to catch those things like, uh, I think this word is wrong. Your sentence structure isn't very solid. Um, you need to make a paragraph here instead of uh, just running a whole bunch of information together. I think these things should be bulleted to bring them to the to better attention. Uh, that's pretty important. And if you have somebody do that, uh, you'll find that your proposal is going to be in a lot better shape. Here's my information. If you need anything to uh, to find people, um, that, that's me. And you can always go to the Flower Hill uh, webpage and you'll get access to all of the uh, MPPTA people. With that, I'm going to stop sharing, I think. There it is. And kick this back over, I believe, to Dave. Awesome. Thank you so much, so much for that, Rob. Uh, Dave, are you still here with us? Got to undo. There we go. Okay. Now let's see if, is my screen up there, Sean Dean? Yeah, it's up here. Uh, maybe switching to um, the presentation. If you have like dual screens. I do. So let me stop and um, how's that? Solid. Okay. All right. So just a, a couple of things to, to wrap up here is that I stressed earlier that, you know, you can't pay for technical assistance because we're here to provide it you. That's why USDA has, has brought us on board. So this is really no cost te technical assistance. And it's for all kinds of education and information. 
It's to help you develop your business plans for products that you may be processing, um, strategic planning, financial statements, cash flow, all of those things. And you can just access that technical assistance uh, th uh, through the USDA.gov MPPTA site. Now, the four areas that we work on for the technical assistance is number one, federal funding. How do you locate the grants? Um, do you qualify for the grants? So not only on this one, but if you know tribes are, are looking at some of the other ones, we can our network can help you sort that through of what's out there and who's eligible. Developing the agricultural businesses, as I said at the outset, this isn't just about building facilities; it's about developing successful enterprises. And then the processing technical and operational support, everything from building your facilities to distribution and, and the like, and then supply chain development, all the way from bringing the animals into the plant to getting the, the, the products distributed either to your community or to the marketplace. And we have been putting a lot of attention into how do we help folks utilize all of the byproducts so that we can utilize every part of the animal? So we're doing a lot of work in hides and leather and pet food and other products, all as a part of the technical assistance program. Now, here's the slide I was looking for it at the beginning, but these are the folks that are part of this technical assistance network. And as I mentioned, um, we also have partnerships through memorandums of understanding with more than a dozen other organizations that are helping us do outreach, but also have resources that they're bringing to the table. So when you take a look at this network, this is really a diverse group that brings a whole range, a whole suite of resources to be able to work with you as you're, you're developing your proposal and implementing your project. Now, for those that haven't applied for our technical assistance, it's very easy and painless to do. You can just go to that QR code and that will take you to the site that has a technical assistance form, or you can go to the Flower Hill Institute website and just go to the MPPTA tab, and there's a request there. It takes less than five minutes to fill out, and all we're really looking for is who, who you are, where you are, what are you looking to do, and what kind of assistance do you need? And that really helps us filter it through, because when that comes in, we have a chance to review that request. And then many times we'll circle back and say, gosh, we need a little bit more information so that we can know how to help you a little bit better. Or some folks just put in that they're looking for a certain document or a certain uh, website. And so we'll pass that on. But the most important thing that we do is we try and connect folks with the appropriate technical assistance providers. And that's why having the Intertribal Agriculture Council is so critical to this is for the number of tribes and, and tribal producers that have uh, approached us and applied for technical assistance and is great to have them on the ground providing that, um, that information. So finally, on this grant, a couple of details is that the submission deadline is July 19th at 11.58 p.m. Eastern time. And I always like to say, uh, or 11.59 Eastern time, I always like to say, don't wait until 11.58 to submit. Um, it's very important to go in early and go into usda.gov backslash meet, go to open grants, get the information on this grant. The RFA has some links that can take you right into how do you get your SAMS number? How do you get your UIE? And as Rob said, most tribes have, have you know, submit a grants and probably have that set up. But if not, that's something to do well ahead of time because it can take up to two weeks to get that information. Then <clears throat> there is the our program that's available at no assistance. USDA also has a help desk that's dedicated to this grant. It's IAG at USDA.gov. Flower Hill on our website, we have our toolkit that has a lot of information. And one of the reasons to be in our system for technical assistance is that we provide all of the folks that are in our database with a monthly newsletter, but also periodic e-blast. If a, if a grant comes open or there's a new development, 
The folks that are in our database are the first to know about it. So with that, I would just say that um, my contact information is there. As I mentioned at the outset, Chris has been working with tribes and, and tribal uh, nations for more than 15 years on food security and meat processing. His information is there. And then there's also the IAG at USDA.gov. So with that, I will again stop it and turn it back to you, Shandine. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Dave. Thank you so much, Dr. Robert, for all that information. If anyone wants um, anyone on the panel uh, have any more things to add for today's presentation? Um, if not, we're going to go ahead and move into our next segment for today's webinar presentation. We're going to go ahead and do a little bit of a Q&A session. Uh, I've noticed a few folks have already entered a few questions into the Q&A box. So I'm going to go ahead and run through <laughs> the submitted questions on down in chronological order. And Dave, Rob, anyone on the panel today, uh, please feel free to jump right in and you know share your expertise, share your thoughts, and share a few additional tips and resources for folks um, as, as it applies. Um, so going into the first question from one of our uh, guest audiences, um, a grant applicant asked, are tribal LLCs eligible to apply? No, LLCs are a, uh, a private business. And so uh, again, this is very specific to tribal governments and their related entities like departments of agriculture and the like. Can funding be used for value added equipment? Example, canning and smoking? Absolutely. Yeah, that's very specified in the grant that um, you know anything that can help you process animal proteins can really be can really be used uh, for in this grant. And that's where you know one of the things I noticed the difference between this grant and, and MCAP really talks about a lot of that equipment has to be used for the human food chain, whereas this one, just really talks about processing the animal proteins. And Deacon from the Intertribal Agriculture Council asks about a tribe that wants to purchase a fish seafood processing plant that has been in existence for decades. How many and who will make the decision if a plant is outdated or not? Well, that's, that's a question, uh, I guess, um, on that. I don't think whether it's outdated or not is, is really a criteria of whether or not it's going to be approved. If you look at section 1.8, it just really says uh, purchase renovation and modernization of an inoperable or outdated processing facility, along with, you know, build, expand, or upgrade um, a facility. So it's really pretty open. And, um, you know, if it's been operating for, for years, but it needs some upgrades and you can demonstrate that it's going to be more efficient and have more throughput and, and uh, have more capabilities with the investment through the IEG. You know, that's the key point right there. Um, and another applicant asked, can indigenous animals like seals and whales that are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act count towards non-amenable species? So I'm, I'm going to fudge a little bit here, and, and Tikan or uh, Kier may be able to type in a, a little bit more on, on that, or Chris may have some more knowledge. But um, the way that this is specified, I believe that there are certain protections for tribes that have traditionally harvested those animals. Those traditional species have been part of their traditional food system, and so they are allowed to do that. The Marine Mammal Protection Act just really talks about they don't want to see the populations of certain species fall below a certain level, but that does not negate the ability for cultures and, and uh, indigenous folks who have relied on those animals for centuries, for thousands of years, to use those animals as a part of this project. Now, I'm going to say that I'm going to fudge that. That's my best assumption there, but um, would like to have a little more definitive on that. Thanks, Dave. Another um, applicant asked, would hog slaughter qualify for this grant? It would. Um, hogs are an amenable species, so they would qualify, but you would not get the, um, the, 
what I call the bonus points on that. This really talks about, we wanna focus this first on the indigenous uh, species, um, but hogs are considered an amenable species. So they qualify, but you wanna make sure that you bring in some of the indigenous, some bison, deer, elk, you know, whatever, and, and be able to get those, what I call the bonus points. I would also be, I, I would want to advise that they inform the grant reviewers of how the hogs tie into your culture. You know, if you can show it's not just a food source, but maybe they are culturally relevant to your tribe to, based on the area that you're in. We travel to a lot of areas and see different uh, species that are relevant to certain folks in, in certain regions. So make sure that you're telling that story when you're writing your grants. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris, thanks. Also, just a note, uh, Tikhan responded in the Q&A chat saying, yes, they can. And I believe that it was a response to the uh, question regarding indigenous animals like seals and whales under the Marine Mammal yep. Protection Act. Um, so just Great. to go ahead. Thank and you. Thank you, Tikhan. I feel a lot more comfortable when, uh, yeah. And another applicant asked, would a mobile butchering unit qualify? Absolutely. Again, under section 1.8, it talks about building, expanding, upgrading community, indigenous meat, food sovereignty, har harvesting, processing facilities, fixed or mobile. So it would definitely. And as Catherine and I were talking about the outset, you know, there's some of the traditional, um, you know, curing methods of, of drying meat you know, in, in the teepee over smoked things. Again, they, they really specify um, I forget the exact language, but indigenous informed designs. So that would be, um, you know, some things where don't feel limited uh, to bricks and mortar or fixed facilities or even a traditional uh, mobile trailer. Another applicant um, regarding office hours is asking, will USDA have tribal office hours like they did for LFPA I found these very helpful for that grant opportunity. Well, we don't know on that. They they may, so we'll have to we'll have to check with them. It's a great idea. Um, addressing feasibility studies, must a feasibility study be in place prior to applying? No, this grant does not specify a feasibility study, but it's important. To look, if you look at that scoring criteria, what those reviewers are going to be looking at is, is this project feasible? So you don't have to go out and have a third party do a feasibility study, but you really need to demonstrate that you've got the wherewithal and it's designed uh, to, to be feasible. I see Chris uh, came on yeah, here, so I yeah, wanted I think to he's add got to some that. thoughts on that. Yeah, for, for Lynn, just so you know, make sure that you're thinking through the business side of the project. Make sure that your long-term operating costs are going to be sustainable. Uh, that's something that your IEC technical assistance staff can help with. We can help you with. Uh, make sure that even though that it doesn't require a feasibility study, don't sign up for something that you can't afford to operate, you know, throughout, uh, you know, the, the next years after the grant funds run out. So we don't want anyone to get in trouble here. The next question, um, a little bit lengthy, but I'll go ahead and read through it. Uh, the Nez Pierce tribe produces salmon and steelhead in our hatcheries and in the river of our homelands. And we are interested in building a fish as well as bison game meat processing facility. Salmon and game are critical food sources and this grant seems like it could be a source to get something like this in place. This could help with meeting our food security and take full advantage of these foods that we produce. Oh. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing. I was, I was looking for the question that, but uh, thanks for sharing. No, but I would just illustrate that's a, a perfect um, because you've got a variety of, of, of indigenous species involved there. So, you know, that's likely to get you those 10 bonus points as, as well as just it would strengthen the, the rest of the application as well. 
Yeah, and if you're looking to have an inspected facility, Joseph, uh, you know, reach out and we want to talk about having different species in the same building, how we need to treat that. And if you're going to have HACCP plans, food safety plans, you want to make sure and have these things in place to protect, uh, you know, cross-contamination and processing and those kind of things, if you're going to sell and retail that product. Uh, another applicant asked, can tribes mimic other tribes' facility designs and plans for processing infrastructure? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to be unique. If something's working, don't feel inclined that you've got to do something else. And last question I see in the chat, can tribe purchase land craft, snowmobile, snowmobiles, or tender boat with this grant? Can kelp harvesting and processing equipment be purchased? Can multiple food species equipment be purchased? Line or modules for salmon and line for meat processing? So you have to demonstrate that those vehicles um, are, are integral to the project. Um, you can't just use, you can't get snowmobiles to go out and check on the bison during the winter. But um, if they're integral to bringing them in and you can demonstrate that in the grant, that's the key point. They have to be part of the project to be eligible. If they're outside of the project, they're not eligible. So. Thanks, Dave. I, I'm not seeing any, oh, I have one more question here. It says, can an individual tribe member apply for grants or does the tribal government have to be a part of that business? What if tribe owns the land that the business sits on? So the grant has to come through the tribe. And I know we're working with uh, some folks I've been working with, you know, one that has been through an LLC or in, in a nonprofit, and they are now sitting down with the tribe to say, okay, how can we do this so that this, you know, goes through the tribe, the tribe can then work with other entities within that nation to do some of the implementation of the grant, but the tribal government has to be the applicant and the driver of this project. Awesome, thank you so much for that, Dave. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, but um, I am seeing a notification announcement. Um, Chris, did you wanna share anything else? Yeah, there was a couple other parts to Andrew's question. I want to make sure we get uh, all of all of Andrew's questions answered. Uh, um, you asked about multiple species and multiple types of equipment, and the answer is yes, Andrew. You can you can harvest all kinds of equipment uh, or harvest all kinds of animals uh, with the equipment that you purchase. So in turn, you can get various types of equipment to harvest those animals. Uh, you know, and how, however they tie to you and your culture and your area. So I want to make sure we clarified that. Yeah, thanks. And, and again, you know, and as Chris said, yeah, as, as you do that, particularly if you're doing amenable or 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 just as a, a common, you know, safety practices to make sure you, ha you have your, your segregation and sanitation and all the normal stuff there. So, but um, yeah, also just to let folks know that on May 30th uh, in Pendleton, at 9 a.m., Chris is going to be up there, and it's going to be a, a meeting on the the meat and poultry uh, technical assistance program. And of course, you got our contact equipment there. Um, make sure you get into our system. We with our MCAP uh, webinar on Monday, we got flooded with a lot of of questions, and we want to make sure that we go through and, and do it through our database so that we've got a record and we know how we're responding and and you know, doing it appropriately. So please, please, please get into our system for technical assistance. Yeah, and I'll add, since uh, Nikki shared that note about the meeting in Pendleton, um, we, we are trying to uh, participate in as many as the regional summits uh, as possible that IEC is hosting. So just know that uh, I'll be up in uh, New York with Tina um, week after next uh and then uh as uh, nikki mentioned we'll be in the northwest uh, starting in pendleton but i'll i'll go from pendleton up to montana and then over back into uh, uh northwest washington state uh, that week as well so we're traveling uh, dave and i just lock kind of locked in with uh zane and craig will be uh in uh, montana again in august for that uh, regional summit that'll be too late for this grant though so if you need help uh, before July 19th, make sure that you reach out to 
your technical assistance provider through IEC, as well as, uh, you know, Dave and I are available as well. So uh, all of the IEC technical assistance reps have uh, have our phone numbers and kind of the hotlines, I call them. They know they know how to get in touch with us uh, no matter what time and what day. So uh, make sure that you're using those resources you have. We're all free to you to use. So take advantage of that benefit. So thank you all very much. Awesome. Dave just posted, uh, yeah, if you have folks that couldn't tune in today, as uh, Shandine said at the outset, this is going to be on our YouTube channel and, and on our in our toolkit. Right. Awesome. Thank you so much again to Dave Carter. Um, we, yeah, the, I, was, I just looked at the chat um, and the question and answers, but um, I want to give a big thank you and shout out to Dave Carter for putting together this presentation today and also for hosting today's um, presentation webinar, as well as Dr. Robert Maddock for participating and sharing your expertise um, in today's webinar. Um, just to reiterate, this recording will be posted on the Flower Hill Institute website, the YouTube channel, and anyone who has any additional questions and who would like to get in touch with the MPPTA program, the request form for the MPPTA program is also on the Flower Hill Institute website. Um, and also, if you would want to reach directly out to Flower Hill, we are also able to be contacted via email at usdata at flowerhill.institute. Um, and with that, I leave everyone for the rest of the day. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you to the author presenters and the folks on the panel. And have a good rest of your day, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>